Today, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about an event called the Harlem Renaissance that takes place during the 1920s. The Harlem Renaissance was basically a rebirth, that's what the word Renaissance means, rebirth, of African American culture in the United States. And, and rebirth might not quite be the right word, it's almost a rediscovery, especially by people in the northern United States. Remember, most of the African Americans in the United States in the late 1800s, early 1900s lived in the South. So most northerners didn't have much exposure to African American culture. The Harlem Renaissance is really that exposure of the main population centers of the United States, New York, Chicago, Detroit, Washington, D.C., being exposed to African American culture from the South really for the first time and then discovering this uh, for the first time in, in some cases in the northern areas. Uh, what really starts this? Why, why does this happen in the 1920s? Well, it happens really as a result of the migration to the North of African Americans from the South. This is referred to as the Great Migration, and it happens for a number of different reasons. The Great Migration uh, happens firstly because there's an increased opportunity in the North. As a result of World War I, a lot of the factory owners have been drafted, or factory workers, excuse me, have been drafted into the military, and so the factory workers needed a ready, uh, ready workforce, a ready supply of workers. They found that in the African Americans of the South. Also because of World War I, the reason they couldn't find that with immigrant populations is because those immigrant populations had previously come from Europe. Well, Europe was embroiled in a war, immigration out wasn't easy, and so the, those sources of workers had dried up from immigrants as well. So, so really, almost, uh, almost not by choice, but by force, uh, the force of the market pushes the factory owners of the North to hire these African Americans, whereas before they wouldn't. Probably the most notable among them is Henry Ford. Henry Ford uh, doesn't discriminate in his factories and between white and black, and so African Americans were able to come and get a job at Ford's, and that was a big deal because Ford was one of the higher paying manufacturers of the day. Uh, the other thing that forces the, the Southern uh, African Americans to leave uh, is the arrival of a different type of immigrant, a bug, the boll weevil. The boll weevil had wiped out cotton crops across the South, and, and so as a result, a lot of these African Americans who had really, and their livelihood had depended on farming, sharecropping, were unable to go ahead and make ends meet because of the boll weevil. And throw on top of that some floods and droughts that came around during the 1920s and then uh, continued through the 1930s, and African Americans really, they had to leave. Uh, there was no way for them to support themselves. And at the same time, you have this opportunity opening up in the North, and it's not hard to see why so many African Americans chose during the 1920s to leave the South and move to the North. Some folks might attribute it to their, their fleeing from discrimination, and there certainly had to have been some of that. Uh, the conditions in the South were pretty rough with Jim Crow and segregation. Uh, lynchings had become commonplace across the South, especially of African Americans. But in reality, the, the conditions, I, I'm not sure, were all that much better in the North. Evidence of that, the Chicago race riot of 1919, where 38 people are killed and 520 are injured, it turns into a citywide riot. Uh, the, the National Guard has to be called in and martial law declared to restore order. The whole incident happens because of segregated beaches. There was a young African-American male um, down at Lake Michigan. He went out swimming. He was on the African-American side of the beach. And... Uh, Along Lake Michigan, there's what's called a long shore current. He swims out a little far as he tries to swim back. The current pushes him down, and he actually starts swimming up onto the white beach. Well, the white folks think this is a little cheeky of him, and so they think that this is ridiculous, so they start throwing stuff at him. Well, the guy can't, can't get to shore. He struggles. He's not a strong swimmer anyway. He drowns. He dies right in the sight of everybody on the beach, and the African Americans just absolutely um, are incensed, and a riot breaks out, and it spills over into the city. Um, and again, uh, so a lot of it really racially motivated fear and prejudice in the North as well. And, and not just because of racial, racial prejudice. A lot of the workers in the North uh, were afraid of the African Americans coming up because they, they were afraid they'd drive wages down. There were economic fears, as with any immigrant population. Uh, and so there were lots of reasons why uh, the discrimination in the North also could be, could be pretty bad. Um, certainly you might not have had the lynchings that you had in the South and you didn't have Jim Crow, and that's certainly an improvement but things weren't all that great in the North either. Uh, so where did these uh, African Americans go? What were some of their destinations? By the time it's all said and done, approximately almost 2 million people, 1.8 million, arrived to cities such as Chicago, Washington, D.C. They come to New York, they come to Detroit, they come to Philadelphia. Uh, but really the Harlem Renaissance is focused obviously on New York, a neighborhood called Harlem. Uh, and this is a, a place, uh, an epicenter, if you will, for a lot of the, the cultural developments in the African-American community uh, during the 1920s. Uh, and this is where a lot of uh, Northerners are really exposed to it. And so the Harlem Renaissance, again, referring specifically to the neighborhood in New York City called Harlem. Uh, 
it's also a rebirth not only of African American culture in the United States, uh, but it's also a, a time where a lot of African American leaders come to the fore. Uh, guys like W. E. B. Du Bois, a uh, very highly educated professor of he economics and history, uh, and, and he's a social activist. He starts the Niagara Movement and the NAACP. Both of those are civil rights organizations uh, that are seeking equality for African Americans. Of course, the NAACP. Uh, still a prominent civil rights organization today. Originally stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Peoples. Uh, they don't refer to it by that anymore, just by its acronym, NAACP. <coughs> also, leaders like Marcus Garvey, who was actually a native of Jamaica. He wasn't from the United States, but he coins the term, the slogan, Black is Beautiful. And, and he's different. Uh, W.E. Du Bois want to be, wants society to accept African Americans. Marcus Garvey says, you know what, they're never going to accept us, so we shouldn't be try to be like the white folks, and we should probably just go ahead and leave. And he advocates actually a return back to Africa. He ends up uh, starting a, a, a cruise line, the African Star, um, Black Star Line or uh, whatever, and it ends up going defunct and he ends up in trouble for mail fraud and different things. <coughs> Other guys like James Weldon who fights in the courts. He was a lawyer, also a poet uh, during the Harlem Renaissance, and he in particular takes exception to things like anti-lynching, or uh, lynching, and he gets an anti-lynching law pushed through. He wants to break down white primaries in the South, so, uh, you know, theoretically in the South, anybody could run, but in the primaries, all the candidates that were chosen were always white, and they were closed to African Americans, so that meant only white people uh, would go ahead and run for the different offices. He goes ahead and opposes those things uh, using his law degree in courts, and all of this comes together to form the Harlem Renaissance. Again, sparked by the Great Migration, uh, revival of black culture, and if you want to understand this, uh, there's, a, there's a musical out there called Showboat. Uh, and Showboat is really the story of the birth of jazz, but it also goes ahead and, and highlights uh, really the story of, of what leads into the Harlem Renaissance. And uh, Showboat, again, a, a big famous uh, musical, uh, probably the most famous number in there, Old Man River, uh, song, sung most notably by probably by Paul Robeson. Um, but again, chronicles the story of the birth of jazz and, and, and really takes place in the setting that of everything leading up to the Harlem Renaissance. Jazz is considered to be by most people, uh, most observers, most historians, the most significant cultural contribution of the Harlem Renaissance. And some people consider it the most significant cultural contribution of the United States to the world. Um, jazz, really a, a combination of uh, gospel and blues coming together um, uh, and, and, and mixing. Uh, and so, uh, again, you get some uh, jazz, and jazz is improvisation, a lot of stuff like that, and um, based off of basic themes. Uh, and, and some of your most famous jazz musicians until this day are from the Harlem Renaissance, guys like King Oliver, guys like Louis Armstrong, who uh, most people are familiar with today, Cab Calloway and Duke Ellington are some of the more famous jazz musicians to come out of the Harlem Renaissance. Also significant developments with writers, uh, guys like Langston Hughes and County Cullen and Claude McKay, uh, men and women, uh, go ahead and, and, uh, and, and come to prominence during the Harlem Renaissance. <laughs>